This morning in the Sunday school, we had a split session. We had the men uh, here in the auditorium, and the ladies went over next door with uh, missionary Tracy Fowler, and uh, Anna told me it was just a blessing. Uh, she had a, a good lesson on gratitude. And uh, we asked, we saw in Matthew chapter 1 as the wise men came to worship, and we said, wise men still seek God. And the question that they ask is, uh, we have come to worship he who was born king of the Jews. And, and so that was their question, where is he that was born king of the Jews? And tonight we look in uh, Psalm 24 and we see this uh, phrase in, chapter, in verse number 10 that says, Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. And so we want to look at this psalm tonight and just answer the king of glory. Um, but coming out of that question, thinking about those wise men that came to sing, to seek he that was born king of the Jews. In Psalm 24, we see the good shepherd. Uh, in Psalm 23, we say it's the great shepherd. In Psalm 24, is uh, said to be the chief shepherd. Uh, we can find or see references in chapter 22 to the cross and the earthwork of Jesus Christ. Uh, in 23, we see a pointing towards heaven. Uh, it might be the church age as we move into heaven. And then usually in chapter 24, we see the glory of God, uh, or we might say the millennial kingdom, and uh, points towards that. And so as we read this tonight, I just want us to point or point our minds again to this king of glory. Our morning message this morning, uh, looking at Mary's uh, phrases of what she said in those 10 verses, 10 of the 15 uh, things that Mary says that are recorded in the scriptures really pointed our minds uh, to a magnifying of God, to an exalting of God, to lifting our voices to praise the God who has come to redeem us. And I believe tonight we'll just kind of carry that theme through as we look at this, who is the King of Glory? And so notice in verse number 1, Psalm 24, the Bible says, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, see love. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. See love. And we see two places in there, verse number 6 and verse number 10, the word Selah. And it just reminds us, stop and think. Stop and think on these truths. Stop and think on what has been said. The Lord, the King of glory. And as we sang tonight, my mind goes back to who is he in yonder stall. And as we close the service tonight, we'll think about that chorus. But as Jacob was saying, hey, I'm going to sing uh, that song as well. Who was he, right? Uh, he came to earth. There was a lonely stable there. Christ was born in that stable. He came to die for you and I. And so tonight as we look at this, we see the King of glory high and lifted up. And we ought to go into the next few days just with a heart full, bursting with what our Savior has done for you and I. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you tonight. Lord, our, our hearts and our minds just are ready to explode with the excitement of knowing that you are our Savior. Lord, to think of all that you've gone through to provide redemption for us. Lord, that you would love us so much that you would leave heaven's splendor. You would leave the side of God the Father to come to this old, sinful, wicked world, to die on an old Roman rugged cross. Lord, for our sins, to take upon us or take upon yourself the sins of mankind, to redeem us and to pay for our purchase price, uh, to take us back out of sin and to give us a relationship with you. Lord, that we can be promised eternal life, that we can know that you're coming back for us. Lord, that you'll say whosoever will. Uh, Lord, what an opportunity, what a blessing that is ours to know you through the scriptures tonight. Help us as we look at these verses, Lord. May our eyes, may our hearts, may our, our minds and all of us be tuned into you. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 
notice as we open this up, we can compare Scripture with Scripture. Uh, in both the Old and New Testament, we find that this King of Glory uh, mentioned in verse number 10, who is asked, who is he? Verse number 8 asks the same question, who is this King of Glory? And as we search the Scriptures, Old and New, we come to the conclusion that he is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody else could fit the description. Nobody else could fit the bill. Uh, it, it again, again, parallels our Wednesday night study that that was God's eternal plan. No one else. There is no other way. Uh, for God, for Jesus Christ, is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father. So we see this as a pattern throughout scriptures. Uh, we understand that it is the only way. And notice in verse number 1 and 2 that he is the creator, the Lord of glory. We see in verse number 1, the earth is the Lord's. And the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell in, therein. And we understand that because He is the Creator. He created it. He put it into place. He spoke it into existence. So thereby, it is His by ownership. Uh, a man has chosen sin, and God has chosen to redeem us back from our sin. Uh, so He has not only created us, we're not only His by creation, we're His once we're saved by redemption as well. And notice in verse number 2, he says, For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. If you put a bookmark here and go with me back to Genesis chapter 1, and let's look at this uh, truth that Jesus Christ is the creator. And God is, is amazing to me again. I've probably said it before, but God doesn't argue. God doesn't lay out a bunch of evidence. God simply says in Genesis 1.1 1, 1, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. You're a fool, the Bible would say, if you don't believe in God. If you don't believe that God is the creator, you're foolish. Because God has told us that he is the creator. That he is the one that has created the heavens and the earth. And he's laid out for us in the days how he did it. In 24-hour periods, he did these different steps of, of creation in six days. And on the seventh day, he rested. And so God, this King of glory, is the creator. And we see it here in uh, Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2. But Genesis 1, 1 lays that out. And as we look in verses 1 and 2, and he says he formed it, and he brought it out of the floods. Well, notice with me in Genesis 1, verse number 6. The Bible says, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament, from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And so as we understand, in day one, we, God divided the light from the darkness. He separated everything that was just out there in dark, and he created light or spoke light into existence. And now we've got two separate entities, complete opposites, polar opposites, we might say. God kind of reminds us of the difference between God Almighty and Satan, right? Absolute opposites on, on the ends of the spectrum. Then God says, let there be a firmament, we see in verse number 6. And so he's going to separate that atmosphere up into the heavens. He's going to create a heavenly atmosphere, which would be above the earth. And so it says that he, he placed that above there, and God called the firmament heaven. The evening and the morning of the second day. And then notice verse number 9, God said... Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. And so God creates light and darkness. God then creates this firmament, which would be the heavens, would be above us where the birds and things will fly. He then begins in this third day of creation to separate the, the seas, the waters that are covering the face of the earth, and he makes uh, dry land appear, and he calls that land. And so he separates that. And in verse number 2 of Psalm 24, we see that he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. We are given a, a glimpse or an insight into what Jesus Christ, the creator, was doing back in Genesis 1-1, where he says God created the heavens and the earth. So again, our minds have to accept the fact that Jesus Christ was God. He was eternally existent prior to the creation. He was there. And now in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning of time as we know it, God began to create. And that creator was none other than Jesus Christ, the King of glory. The second thing we see is in verse number 8. I'm sorry. Uh, let's continue with the thought of the creator. Go to John 1-1. Go to John 1-1. Trying to get ahead of myself in the notes. John 1 1. 
And the Bible says again, in the beginning. Well, Genesis 1-1 told us in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Our psalm, Psalm 24, tells us that it was Jesus Christ, this King of glory, that was creating, that was doing the separating and bringing these things into existence. In John 1, 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So He is the eternal existing God. He is the Son of God. And we know that the Jews in, in the Gospels gave Him such a hard time. They, they uh, charged Him with um, blasphemy because He was claiming to be the Son of God. To be the Son of God made me the Messiah of the Old Testament. To be the Messiah of the Old Testament made me God who was going to come earth to earth to redeem mankind. Therefore, he could only be the Son of God. He could only be this King of glory, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh for you and I. And so we see here, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was not only with God, the Word was absolutely God. He's 100% God. When he came to earth in the form of a baby boy, he was 100% man, but he left none of his divinity behind. He was 100% God, 100% man. In verse number two, the, the Bible says the same, this God, this Jesus Christ was in the beginning with God. He's eternally existent. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. The creator is this king of glory. Look in Colossians chapter number one, Colossians chapter one, verse number 15. Colossians 1 and verse number 15, again, this King of glory is the creator of the universe. He owns us by creation, and yet he chose to redeem you and I from our sins by giving himself on the cross for you and I. Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 15, the Bible is speaking about Christ uh, coming down into this verse. He says, who is, speaking of Christ again, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And so it took the shed blood of Jesus Christ to redeem you and I, to redeem all things back to God the Father. We understand from Romans that all creation groans under the curse of sin. It wasn't good enough that, that Jesus would have maybe cut his hand or that they would have uh, maybe sliced him with a knife. He had to hang on the cross. He had to shed his blood in the crucifixion to pay for our sins. That was God's eternal plan. It wouldn't have been enough should he just die without being hung on that Roman cross. It took the beatings. It took the shame. Uh, he took our sin upon himself. And the Bible says he made peace through the blood of his cross to by him to reconcile all things unto himself. And so this is the King of glory. In our eyes, as we lift up to him, ought, our, it ought to fill our hearts with the same expression that Mary says this morning. My soul doth magnify the Lord. With all that is in me, my being exalts the Lord, this King of glory. Notice number two, in, back in uh, Psalm chapter 24, we'll see that he is the Lord, strong and mighty. Verse number eight in Proverbs 24, verse number eight, it says... Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. And so again, we understand that God is, is strong and mighty and that He goes before His people. It was God that led the children of Israel out of Egypt and into the Promised Land. It was God that allowed them to come up to the Red Sea and to kind of feel like they were being pinched between the mountains and the rock and between the sea. And here comes the Egyptians up behind them. But it was the mighty hand of God that split the sea wide open and allowed them to pass through on dry land so that they could go into the promised land. It was God that ran out the giants from before them. It was God that created uh, and allowed them space to move into the land. It was God that told them, hey, if you'll go into the land and you'll continue to battle and you'll continue to take it over, I'll go before you and I'll win the battles for you. 
But as they get into the land and they get comfortable and they kind of stop taking over the land that God had given to them, they kind of just sat in what they were happy with and they began to just kind of get lazy in their Christianity and their relationship with God. And we see the, the, the punishment, we see the lack of blessings, we see that all God had promised and would have given to them, they've given up that really by, by default because they've not done what God has told them to do. But in that, he is the Lord, strong and mighty. Isaiah 9, 6 tells us, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I've noticed recently in some Christmas cards and different things that I've read, uh, some calendars, different stuff, I, don't, I haven't looked, I don't know what translation it is, but they take the comma out of wonderful counselor and they run it together. He is the wonderful counselor. Absolutely, he is the wonderful counselor, but our Bible separates it for a purpose, for a reason. He is wonderful. He deserves all of our praise. He deserves to be magnified in our lives. And then he is the counselor. And if we want to say wonderful counselor, sure, but don't take away from him the title of wonderful. Right. He's absolutely wonderful in and of himself. He is the counselor that will counsel us. He is the counselor that will lead us into the scriptures through the Holy Spirit and give us what it is that we need in our time of need. But then he is also the mighty God. And, and you can think about it. I think of maybe some flex muscles. And, and God is that flex muscle. God is that right hand of strength. And he goes before his people. And as we said in Psalm 55, 22, right? He will not suffer the righteous to be moved. God is that strength of, uh, that arm of strength that goes with his people. This is the king of glory. Notice in verse number 10, we see he is the Lord of hosts. It says, who is this king of, of glory? The Lord of hosts. Verse number 8 asks us the same thing. And then it says, the Lord, strong and mighty. Again, he is the God of battles. He is the God that goes forth with his armies. He's got a host of angelic beings that can, that can do anything at his beck and call. Turn with me to Romans chapter, or I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 19. And let's look at this final battle as God leads his armies into battle. Revelation chapter 19 and verse number 11. This king of glory, this king of hosts. Revelation chapter 19 and verse number 1. We see this again, the second coming of Christ. And as we say in Psalm 24, kind of leading us towards the millennial kingdom, that reign of God, Christ in his glory. We see here in Revelation 19 and verse number 11, the Bible says, And I saw the heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Our mind goes back to John 1, 1, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. Here his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. He hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. As we begin looking and keep your place there, keep uh, stay there. Let me go back to Psalm 24 and it says in verse number 5, He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. So we have this uh, occurring or reoccurring theme of the righteousness of God and the righteousness of God being imputed to us. And here we see that God is going to wipe out the nations who have rejected him, who have turned their back, who have had every opportunity to follow this Lord of righteousness, this, this God of glory or this King of glory, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And, and as I begin reading in verse number 11, this, this white horse that as heaven opens, uh, and again you have maybe some liberty to let your mind run, your imagination. Uh, can you imagine if this is the King of glory? 
uh, the arm, the strong, mighty arm of God, this king of armies, the king of hosts, what a horse must look like for him to ride on it. And then those little puny horses behind that just have us on it as we follow. And as you think about it, we're the host and we're the army, but we're not doing anything. We're simply following, saying, get them, get them. Yeah, right? And we're not going to be doing anything except for following our Lord of glory, this King of glory, the Lord of lords and King of kings. And what an awesome spot to think. Uh, not because I've done anything. I haven't earned it. I don't deserve it at all. But God loved me so much that he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for us. And if we'll simply accept it, he'll give us eternal life. And we shall be there on those white horses. Notice again, uh, back in, in, just stay here. The scripture, though, reveals that through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the psalmist David was writing about the Lord Jesus Christ a thousand years before Christ's first coming. It was prophesied, these things. In Psalm 22, he's telling about the cross. He's telling about the suffering that Christ is going to go through. We have the 23rd Psalm. Then we have the 24th Psalm. And, and David is writing all these things about God, about Christ, this King of glory, a thousand years before he ever stepped foot on this earth. And absolutely every single one of those things have come to pass or will come to pass to the letter. Again, we've mentioned several times in the last week uh, and this morning, I believe, in the Sunday school class, over 324 specific messianic prophecies that came to pass in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, born in a manger in a small town of Bethlehem. No other person could have fit the bill. That was God's eternal plan, and there was no other way for it to be done. He was the Messiah. He was God in the flesh to redeem mankind. David obviously knew and loved this wonderful creator, the Redeemer, the King, this King of glory, this coming King of kings and Lord of lords. And so should we. I believe as we looked at Mary and her heart this morning and just an attitude, uh, humility and service that just created this attitude of praise and worship and her desire just to magnify her Savior. As we see tonight in the psalm, that was David's heart. He just wanted to magnify this King of glory. And it ought to be our heart's desire as well. Notice verse number three. The psalm asks the question, who then shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Now, the question might be, what person is allowed to enjoy such privilege and such fellowship with the king of glory? If you think about it, what king on this earth? Uh, you can think of some kings maybe in Jordan and Saudi Arabia that might have some kings. Uh, England has some princes. We've got a president. Who, what people are allowed in the presence of those people? And yet God invites us into his presence. He invites us to come before his throne of grace daily, of moment by moment. Uh, every second of the day, if I so choose, I can be in his presence. And what king would invite us? And David says, who? Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who has invitation into the presence of this king of glory? And then he answers it in verse number four. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul, unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He gives the answer, he that has clean hands and a pure heart. But how can sinful man approach a thrice holy God with clean hands and a pure heart? Well, I believe he gives us the answer here that my hands are clean. It's, it's not by works of righteousness which I have done. It's not by a heart that's lifted up in vanity and pride that says, I can do it my way. We simply bow before the cross and we say, I have no other option. I have no other way. I have no other means to get there. In and of myself, I'll split hell wide open. I need a Savior. And we humbly bow before the cross and say, Lord Jesus, please, please save my soul. And so he that has clean hearts and a pure, or hands and a pure heart, who's not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Uh, we are all sinners. We've all come short of the glory of God. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, Isaiah 64, 6. Go to Romans 3 and verse number 10. Let's look at the, the horrible picture that it paints for us as sinners born into sin. Romans 3 and verse number 10. Romans 3 and verse number 10. The Bible says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. 
No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher, it's, a, it's an open tomb. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And so we come down, verses 10 through 20, and we just see this horrible plight of man as we're born into sin, as we're born with a sin nature, and there is no good in any of us. There is no hope in any of us. But then we see these precious words in verse number 21, But now, but now, the righteousness of God without the law, maybe we would say apart from the law, the law, my good works, my good keeping, my ability to do something, is not going to count. He says, without the law is manifested, being witnessed though by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. Again, I would circle that word believe right there. I, again, would share with you. This week, uh, I don't know how many passages of Scripture that God has just kind of put the light bulb on, on that little word. We come to believe. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth. It comes down to our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And here He says that He gave uh, His life. He gave his, uh, his, his life on the cross. He died for all mankind. But it is upon them that believe. It's available to all. It's available to whosoever will, but only those who accept it is it effectual to, uh, for them and for their eternal salvation. But he says there is no difference. All have sinned. All have come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. Um, that's the, saving, the uh, satisfying payment in full. How is, it, how is it received? Through faith. In his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. And so it is that imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ on our behalf, as we through faith accept his gift of grace, his righteousness is imputed unto us, and we're made at peace with God the Father. No longer does the wrath of God abide on us. We are now sons of God. We're now entered into the family of God. And notice back in Psalm 24, verse number 6, he gives us this answer. Again, if you read verse 4 and 5, uh, who shall ascend, verse 3, into the hill of the Lord, who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Again, it is absolutely the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ on our behalf. The great love of the King of glory, his recognition of our hopeless, lost estate, be, allow him to become our sin bearer, but also to become our righteousness. I give you some verses you can look up for the sake of time. 1 Peter 2 and verse number 24. Actually, let's, let's go ahead and go there. Let's look at two more verses. Uh, 1 Peter 2 and verse 24. 1 Peter 2, verse 24. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 24, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes he were healed. And so Christ took on our sins. He bore our sins on his own body, on the tree, he took it to the cross and he died there for you and me. God the Father turned his back on Jesus Christ the Son. He could not look on our sins. And Christ cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This is why, because he took our sins upon himself. That we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness. Again, the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ on my behalf allows me to have salvation. But then I ought to live in that righteousness. I live a life that is righteous and that reflects a righteous, holy God. For by His stripes, I am healed. 
Look at one more with me. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse number 21. He says in, in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, For he, God, hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So you see these words, we, we keep coming across this word believe. Whosoever will believe can have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Nothing else is going to get me to heaven. Nothing else is going to purify my hands to cleanse my heart that is going to put me in favor with God. I am a sinner. I have come short of the glory of God. Only through the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, is the only thing. That God the Father is going to accept on payment on be, for behalf of my sins. That is the only thing that is going to redeem me. And notice in verse number 17 of, of this same chapter. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by my good works. No. By the money I give to the church. No. Because I do a lot of good things for a lot of people. No. It's one thing. By Jesus Christ. And hath given now to us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. To take the gospel to those around us. That they may come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. To wit, that God was in Christ. Reconciling the world unto himself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. And hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. That word ambassadors is a representative. You and I tonight are representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you would see, uh, sometimes we have these dignitaries that come into town and they'll call us and, and we get a signed post and this person's going to have this tie tack on their lapel, this lapel pin on. This is what you're looking for. These ones are secret service. These ones get into the inner circle. These ones don't go past the outer Whatever it might be. And you'll see the person, a representative of the President of the United States. Wow. But if you and I had a name tag on tonight, it would say a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, what a, what a position. Go back to Psalm 24. Who is this King of glory? Huh. None other than the Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. Christian, stop and think about it tonight. You're a representative. You're an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. The King of glory. The King of kings and Lord of lords. There is none other. And at this time we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That He loved you and I so much. That He would come as a little baby boy in a manger to die on the cross. To save us from our sins. This expresses the blessed truth. Blessings from and fellowship with the King of Glory is guaranteed when He is our salvation. Um, we'll, we'll stop there. That He speaks of this generation in there. I believe that as believers, uh, every generation has a remnant. There's always a group of people that love the Lord in every generation. In verses 7 and 9, He says, Lift up ye gates, lift up your doors, open your heart and mind to the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Only by accepting Him through faith can a person be saved. Christian, are you experiencing the joy of your salvation? David said, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Jesus said in John 15, 11, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. The scripture reveals that the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, is the King of glory. And it reveals that this is what he wants from you and I, a personal relationship, that you and I may know the joy of our salvation and the joy of knowing the King of glory. Uh, we sang tonight, Who is he in yonder stall? Tis the Lord, the King of glory. At his feet we humbly bow, crown him, crown him, Lord of all. May we do that this Christmas season. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you.